This commenter has completely changed my perspective on the ending of this chapter. Because just like them, going into this chapter after reading the leaks, I assumed that this new threat was someone connected to the Edens 1. Maybe an android he had created specifically to fight against those who could use Cat Leaper, or possibly one of the three OSG members unique to Universe Zero. But the idea that this might be a member of the Chrono Cult that Rachel mentioned back in Universe 3 never even crossed my mind. But now it's there, and I absolutely love that idea because it makes her possible rivalry with Rebecca all the more personal. But we'll talk about that later on in the video. For now, let's talk about the Yukino Cosmos, because this place, while beautiful to look at, would be an absolute hellscape for me if I was on board Eden Zero. As someone who is much more comfortable in dry, hot environments, I felt the pain Laguna was going through the second he saw all that snow in this chapter. That being said though, I did enjoy seeing the four main members of the crew decked out in their winter gear, but now that the crew has made it to the Yukino Cosmos, they immediately go to meet up with Rachel and Connor on Planet Milt, where they surprisingly enough end up running into Feder of the Rachel Saints Interstellar, as we end up finding out that she is Rachel's personal assistant. We also end up finding out that through this extremely large clock cover tower that they use as their base operations, that Rachel and Feder have been observing distortions of time across universes, with each clock pointing to a different point when time was altered in another universe. And sadly, the first and only one that Rebecca ends up recognizing is the one that points to the moment when Shiki was killed by Dragon Joe. It was like despite how long ago that was for her at this point, it's still something that kind of traumatizes her because she has an immediate traumatic reaction to seeing that moment. Now, getting back to the clocks for a second, because I have so many questions for them, like, do they add on new clocks every time there's a new distortion in time, or is each clock assigned to a different universe, and they just move the hand each time something new happens that distorts time in that universe, because either way, it seems like a lot of work, but actually something I would really like to know the answer to. And all the times that Rebecca transferred her consciousness into an alternate future version of herself, do those count as distortion of time, and do each one of those get different clocks for themselves, or is that just affecting the universe that she was in, like, if she transferred her mind to a future version of herself in Universe 3, then does that only affect the clock that actually is active for Universe 3, or does that go to Universe 16's clock as well? And it's so many questions from these clocks that I really want to know the answer to, that unfortunately, I don't think Hero is ever going to take the time to really explore and actually give us an in-depth answer to how they work. Anyway, after a quick and embarrassing for Rebecca family reunion with Rachel and Connor, the gang finds out from Rachel that the Edens 1 is still trying to find its way to Melt, but it's going to take a few years for it to actually find its way without a guide, due to the fact that the planet is hidden amongst about 99, I think they said, more planets that all are just basically drones or satellites that are meant to distract people from finding the real Melt. And the reason why it's actually coming to Melt is because the planet is supposed to be the door to Mutter, or more accurately, it's supposed to be the starting line on the path that should lead you directly to Mutter. I say should because according to Rachel, no adventurer that has traveled from Melts to find Mutter has been successful, with the possible exception being Ziggy, who we can assume was able to find Mutter during his journey. In fact, that's most likely where he picked up Shiki. Also, interesting update on that journey, apparently Ziggy was not traveling with the Shining Stars when he came to Milt, and there's apparently a secret about the Shining Stars that only Rebecca knows about, but Pino also has information locked away in her memories, but as of right now, she's not able to access it. I'm sure at some point near the end of the series, we'll end up finding out exactly what the true secret behind them is, but this is just adding on to the ever-growing mystery of Ziggy's original journey and why he turned Shining Stars and Dark Stars from humans into androids. Now, now, of course, all of this is being discussed after the Eden Zero crew hand over their mother Ephraim to Rachel in order to examine and find them a direct path to her during a bath scene, because you had to know that once Hero put all of the girls in that heavy clothing, that at some point during the chapter there'll be a scene where he gets them almost completely naked. And during the scene, we find out the bath water is the original version of the water that is used in Eden Zero's bath that amplifies a person's ether. This is important because of what happens at the very end of the chapter. You see, after some light blue scenes of the girls in the bath, Feather's Ether Gear detects someone approaching them, but before anyone can react, time suddenly stops, so now everyone is frozen in time, except for Rebecca. And as the chapter ends, we see someone floating in the air behind her, most likely the person Feather was talking about, bringing us all the way back to the person who I was talking about in the beginning of this video. Now, based off this ending, there's really only two possibilities. Either this person stopped time and chose to leave Rebecca unaffected for some strange reason, or this is an evolution of Rebecca's Cat Leaper. This could be why Hero took the time to mention that thing about the water in the ending of the chapter, 
To give reason as to why, despite being told she would lose her time-based abilities when traveling to Universe Zero, that Rebecca was able to freeze time. Maybe after bathing so much in Easy Zero's bath and then coming into this one, helped her gain access to powers that even Rachel didn't know Caliper had. But as exciting as it is to think that Rebecca is getting new powers, it's just as exciting to think that we have a new threat with time-based abilities, because assuming they don't die in this arc, they'll more than likely just be set up to be Rebecca's main opponent during the final battle. Or even if this person does end up dying during this arc, if this truly is the Chrono Cult, then their leader could potentially become Rebecca's big bad for the finale of the series, leaving the only question left being, are they gonna end up joining the Edens 1, or are they gonna stay as a third party in this ever-growing war? But we'll have to wait until chapter 249 to find out the truth of who stopped time and all the other questions that we have after reading this chapter.